Insiders Podcast is for entertainment, education, and information purposes only, and the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease or conditions. For more of the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of those, and should not be interpreted to reflect official policy or position of any entity, aside from possibly cash like more hospital and affiliate outreach programs. If indeed there are any, in fact, there are none. Pretty much we are responsible if it's true. We should always do your own homework and let us know when we're ready. Welcome back to the Curbsiders. Um, usually this is the part where we engage in witty banter and we kind of set the tone for the entire show. Instead, our fearless leader, uh, Dr. Matthew Watto, has decided it might be wise just to leave you with my lonely Kermit the Frog voice to kind of introduce what we'll be talking about today. As a reminder to you folks, we are the Internal Medicine Podcast. We use expert interviews to bring you clinical pearls and practice changing knowledge. Um, and then rather than Shame you all for not listening to the first 10 minutes of the show. I'm just going to get right into it. We have a fantastic episode this for you today. Um, this is one of our dispatches from SGIM or SIGM or uh, SGEM 2019. And for this episode, we're going to be focusing on LGBT care and primary care. We have two fantastic guests with us who will talk us through a general approach um, and then also talk about some of the updates that they actually gave to us at the conference in a, in a separate talk. So our our first guest that we have for you is Dr. Jenny Siegel. She is the medical director for the Center for Transgender Medicine and Surgery at Boston Medical Center, as well as the associate program director for the Boston Medical Center Internal Medicine Residency Program, where she runs the Urban Health and Health Equity Training Pathway. She is a graduate of Harvard Medical School and completed her residency and chief residency at UCSF through the San Francisco General Primary Care Internal Medicine Track. She has been recognized as a clinician educator with multiple local and regional teaching awards and has developed curricula on topics including health equity, social determinants of health, LGBTQ health, addiction medicine, ambulatory care, and health advocacy. We are also fortunate to have with us Dr. Megan Megan McNamara. She's the physician director for the Comprehensive Transgender Clinic, also known as the GIVE Clinic at Lewis Stokes Cleveland Center, VAMC where she is also the Physician Director for the Transforming Outpatient Primary Care Center of Excellence Residency. She's a graduate of the University of Pittsburgh Medical School and completed her internship, residency, and fellowship with a concentration in women's health at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. She is an accomplished clinician educator and has expertise in multiple areas, including LGBTQ care, women's health, and evidence-based medicine. And so without further ado, I'm excited to present to you our show. Well, Jenny and Meg, thank you so much for joining us. This is it's going to be a very low-key recording, so we're going to start off with a low-key question. Jenny, well, I'll ask you first. Can you tell the audience a one-liner about yourself and include something that you do outside the world of medicine just so they know that you're a real person that doesn't just see patients all day? Fair enough. I am a human being. I guess I am a recently turned 40-year-old internist, um, mother of a child, daughter who keeps me on my toes, who loves to be outside and loves to kind of obsess over my pressure cooking, vegetarian pressure cooking in my Instant Pot. I've I've heard a lot about these Instant Pots. Yeah, I was and like, wait, brand name reference? I, I am think, I allowed to do that? <laughs> sure. Uh, they're one of our biggest sponsors. Yes. Oh, of course. Our, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> or, or maybe they should be. They probably should be. They're wonderful. What, what is a good vegetarian dish to cook in that in that device? Oh, there are so many, but I mean, I guess I would just say anything related to beans. It takes them to a whole new level. <laughs> Steel cut oats. Now you are on. talking my language. Okay. Yes, many wonderful. <laughs> just, All right. your, your famous obsession with beans. I'm glad <laughs> we finally. Who's not a? I have to <laughs> admit, the first time I used an instant pot, it was terrifying. Right. It, it like makes this huge noise. There's right. all this steam, and I'm just like, oh no, it's gonna explode like then what do i do right. it didn't uh it all <laughs> turned out okay it doesn't like even the um, mishaps but it was scary the scary yeah. ones i suppose we should like you know debunk the myths the lid's not going to blow off no yeah. injuries no medical risk to the instant pot but you may have a scary moment yeah yeah meg so same question to you and uh any if you want to tell us about any devices in your kitchen <laughs> as well. i do not have an instant pot so i'm a 45 year old mom of two a 10 year old and an eight year old um, and I really like to run Spartan races, which are obstacle races. Um, they are very humbling. I can only get through like three fourths of the obstacles, but they're very fun. I ha- I haven't done one. They're like because the the tough mutter is more of like a team based approach, yeah. right? But the Spartan race is just <laughs> like, like yeah. everybody for themselves. Yeah, I mean, th- you know, I always do it with a group of friends and my okay. husband, so we help each other. But yeah, it's a little bit more like suck it up and do it yourself. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but like, what kind of obstacles? Because I've never heard of this. What kind of obstacles we're talking about? Like swinging medicine balls, or like pits, or like what are? <laughs> so like um, crawling under barbed wire. 
That's a popular one. Sure, Uh, why would it be? Yeah, climbing a rope, like a high rope, like 25 feet up. Um, Then just climbing a bunch of, you know, like, you know, um, structures and then picking up tires and that kind of thing. They're like electricity involved. Uh, there was a- Actually, there is. Oh my God. I've heard one where there's electricity involved, but the ones I've done are just barbed wire, like straight up barbed right. wire. I, I mean, more than that would be crazy. Yeah. I just like to say that the Instant Pot sounds much less scary <laughs> than the spaces, to be clear. <laughs> They're very fun, though. <laughs> um, I'll, go, I'll go with the movie question, I think. It, an old classic. So I, I haven't seen a movie I've liked in forever, and it doesn't have to be medical-themed. It doesn't have to be... Um, anything theme just tell me a recent movie that you've seen that you've enjoyed and i actually for each of you that you would recommend for me okay uh, i'll go first avengers endgame i will not do the spoiler alert but it's awesome <laughs> this was like the one question i couldn't answer because i was like i have a three-year-old movie leave the house what but i was going to say that re- if i can answer about a book because i do find that reading five or ten pages at a time is feasible that i just read less by andrew sean greer and it is a really fun easy read it's called Less? It's called Less. Can you tell us just like syn- a s- brief synopsis? What's it? Yeah, I mean, it's actually transition star topic a little bit. It's about this guy who's about to turn 50. He's a gay man and who, you know, sort of as he's coming up to this juncture of this huge change in life for himself, he's traveling all over the world and gets into all these adventures. And I don't want to say more than that because then there's the spoiler alert, but it's it's okay. very fun. Sounds good. Yeah. Yeah, so my next question for you guys is, what is your favorite failure and what did you learn from it? So why don't we start with you, Meg? Okay, so like that Spartan race, I have, <laughs> I've run three Spartan races and I have yet not successfully climbed the rope. And <laughs> it is very frustrating. So I actually bought a rope and hung it from a tree outside my house to practice and I still haven't been able to do it. So it's one of those things where it looks really easy and then it's super hard to do and there's a ton of technique. So that's my, you know, like all things in life, it looks easy and then it takes a lot of practice. No, there's no knots in the rope? No. Okay. It's a straight climb. Yeah, that yeah. sounds tough. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you always see the five-year-old kids, they can just- Oh, my daughter can do it like a little yeah. monkey. Yeah. I know. My yeah. child was just like, I climbed the thing. And yeah. you're like, what? Okay. No. <laughs> it's <Yeah>. amazing. <laughs> And Jenny, what would you say your favorite failure has been? So my, mine is from a long time ago, but I think it informs me. So when I was in junior high, I tried to start an early recycling program and I was like so gung-ho. It was my early activism and people were just not into it and would throw all this food into the recycling bin. And so I would actually get in there myself and clear it out and like kind of wave around the hamburgers, like don't put this in here, which really helped my <laughs> reputation a lot as a junior high kid. Um, but actually, like, I feel like you learn a lot from that, like in, just in terms of keeping it going, I've kept up the activism and you learn that you like literally have to get into it sometimes to get past it so that story has stayed with me that's right i don't even know you can qualify that as a failure like that just oh sounds, there's that's... i think when you're an eighth grader standing up in your high school cafeteria waving a cheeseburger and being yeah. like you're a horrible person for not recycling <laughs> i guess you especially know. coming out of the trash i mean probably yeah you kind of yeah, got to unpack that fair. for a few decades but <laughs> <laughs> i appreciate your view on the success kernel within the failure <laughs> Be- before we move on to a case, Paul or Carolyn, did you, did you want to recommend anything to the audience? No, I don't have anything to recommend this okay. week. Yeah, I can recommend. Oh, psh, please, who are you talking to? I'm going to go. <laughs> uh, I think 2018 Gaspar Noe movie uh, Climax. If I've not recommended that before, um, I think I mentioned it on Twitter. It is. It's a, one of those movies. It's a, like all my recommendations. Like one percent of people will probably enjoy it. Um, but if you're familiar with his work, he did, I think, Enter the Void, which is sort of visually spectacular. And it's a movie basically about – it's supposedly based on true events about a dance troupe that are celebrating an after party. And then someone doses their sangria with LSD, and then they just all kind of descend into madness. And so it's it's about as fun as it sounds, but the choreography is spectacular. <laughs> there are like 45-minute long camera takes. Like it just It's incredible to look at. The performances are really great. Most of the movie is actually improvised. Um, so they were the actors – very few of whom were professional, they were mostly dancers, were just given a loose framework and they just sold go to town and the movie's based around that. So it's it's a really it's, it can remind you of what cinema can be, um, rather than just sort of shot reverse shot and then laugh track at the end. So it's a really exciting, kind of fun movie to watch that's also sort of challenging and transgressive. So if you have two hours and don't mind maybe being upset, I, I would recommend Climax. How do they improvise two hours? I mean, it could be done, but <laughs> a lot of a lot of badness would have to be come and like cut. There had to be a ton of garbage on the cutting room floor, I'm sure. Yeah. 
most of Paul's recommendations terrify me. Just just <laughs> hearing the synopsis, Paul. Yeah, no, they're mostly just for me. <laughs> not sure if it's going to be my first movie into <laughs> motherhood, but kid. maybe yeah. on the list. <laughs> Actually, I, I take back a pick of the week. Game of Thrones. Is anybody else I'm watching? Not sure. I'm not up to date. <laughs> not up to date. Okay, no I'm spoilers. Uh, but you know, the end is the end is coming of the season. Oh so gosh. it's a great time to start all of the seasons from one <laughs> to catch up for sure. the finale. That's good to hear. Because yeah. I was like afraid to come out as somebody who doesn't watch the Game of Thrones when like everybody in my sphere is. But you're giving me an opening, which I appreciate. Yeah. And by the time this comes out, it probably it may have ended. Uh, I don't know. It's going to be close. It'll be around yeah. the, the time. So. All right. Well, with that talk, uh, we should we should end there and, and go on to actually talking about the main topic here. So let's start with the case. Yes. Yeah, so today we have a great case for you. So Miss K, she's a 52-year-old female who presents to your primary care clinic as a new patient to establish care. She has a history of depression, anxiety, and tobacco use. She appears nervous, and during your HPI, she disclose, discloses that she is sexually active with men and women. During her history, she discloses that she's avoided coming to healthcare providers after she had a poor experience with the healthcare profession decades ago. She has not been seen by a healthcare professional in over 30 years. Uh, so let's kick the first question to you, Jenny. Uh, can we actually, can you just help us start at first by defining some common gender identity terms for our listeners? Sure. So I'll do that. But I just want to say one thing. I feel like I, I just almost want to congratulate Ms. K for coming in. This is a big deal, you know, three decades not in the healthcare system. And so I would just want to be starting by so validating her for coming and really making it a good experience so she can keep engaging in healthcare for the next 30 years. So I think maybe Megan and I are both going to talk to you a little bit, but I guess I first just wanted to say, you know, we say, LGBT, and then you're going to see LGBTQ, you'll see LGBTQ with a plus. So just to be explicit about the alphabet soup, L is lesbian, G is gay, B is bisexual, T is transgender. I think it is worth mentioning the Q. Depending on who you ask, though, different things, I'll be curious what you say. It's either questioning in terms of your identity or queer, which is a little bit embracing of everything that's not typically of the ordinary related to both sexuality and gender identity. Um, and then the plus often gets in there, and that's because you'll see different strings of letters depending on who you're talking to, sometimes I for intersex, A for agender or asexual. So not to further complicate things, but just to say that I think it's a it's an evolving group of people who are sexual and gender minorities is the other term you'll hear. I don't know if you want to say anything about sexuality versus gender identity, or I can. Yeah, so I think just uh, one thing I always try to keep in, in mind is um, that sexual orientation, sexual identity, sexual behavior is totally different from gender identity. And so that's a, a common, sometimes those terms are conflated. So remembering that sexual orientation is about desire and attraction. Sexual behavior is typically what our people are practicing. So it may be referred to as men who have sex with men, women who have sex with women, MSM, WSW. And then sexual identity is the L and the G and the B. And then transgender is really that discordance between natal sex and uh, gender identity. And so that's sort of a very different set of terms than the LGB part conceptually. Just to be really explicit about that, because I think that's huge to our field in trans health, you know, sex being really more about who you are physically. Oftentimes, you know, it's a boy, it's a girl based on genitals, maybe increasingly in this era based on chromosomes, if you had prenatal testing versus gender identity, which is still a biologic phenomenon, but much more about your own innermost feelings of identity related to gender. And, you know, as Meg already told us in transgender folks, those don't necessarily align your assigned sex from birth versus your gender identity. Worth mentioning, we all have a gender identity. And so cisgender is when those things do line up. So it's worth thinking about for everybody. And the last term, got to throw in non-binary. Some people say non-conforming, gender non-conforming, gender diverse, gender queer. I think those all go in the bucket of challenging us to, th excuse me, challenging us to think a little bit outside of gender as a binary construct, people who reject that notion. This is, maybe this is a bit out of order. I, I, I just feel that the terms are intimidating and you don't want to offend any. So what if what if I use the wrong term? What's the best way to overcome that? Or what's the best way to find out what terms people are actually preferring? 
Yeah, yeah. No, I think it's such a fantastic question. And I think it's not even like, what if I do it? But it's when I will mess that up. I think that's certainly been true for me in my career, whether it's the terminology, or we often talk, especially in transgender health about pronouns, and like, you're going to misgender somebody at some point, or your staff member is going to misgender somebody. And so I think just owning that that's part of this, but also making good efforts to train yourself and to train your staff, and to thinking about both asking people how they want to be referred to and kind of having your quick, you know, oh, I'm so sorry I made a mistake. Here's what we're going to do to get better ready, I think is really helpful. Yeah. And one thing I, I think about as a lot is just practicing that, right? So the terms and the language do seem intimidating. So you just have to practice it. So in my head, I just think when I meet someone new, I say, how would you like to be addressed? So, and just having that language to just ready to go. So it's practiced enough that it just feels as fluid as anything else. Yeah. When I was, when I was reading about this, it sounds like uh, I, I always make this analogy with uh, with a lot of things, but like when you're doing a central line, you have to have like a good setup and it's going to go well when you do that. And it sounds like it starts with like just the, the office staff being str- the trained, the signage you have in your office, the forms, that sort of stuff, which I had never, you know, I hadn't put that much thought into it, but it seems like that is going to set you up because you can avoid some of the mistakes. I think it absolutely begins there. And, you know, a lot of times I think we get asked about how do you create sort of a welcoming environment and you've already alluded to a lot of it. I think the other big thing is technology. You know, so many of us are using EHRs these days and trying to both figure out, and some EHRs are better at this than others, how to get the types of information we just talked about. So somebody's legal sex, which might be different than their gender identity marker that's preferred. Same thing with names. We'll talk about people's legal name, which sometimes you do need for insurance purposes, but also people's use name and having both of those readily available is so helpful, not easy. There's a lot of great work going on in that space. And I think the subtle things too, like you alluded to, so just something really subtle, like having a little rainbow pin on or, you know, on my ID badge, I have a rainbow sticker that I just bought off Amazon. I just bought 500 of them and I distribute those (laughs) rainbow stickers to everyone. But subtle things like that, actually patients really pay attention to because it's sort of that unspoken language. Okay, you're open, you're accepting, even if you make a mistake, I know that you're probably going to be okay with talking about this stuff. Great. Uh, so the next question is, is just as we're sort of talking about terminology, so often we we group these patients together. We use the LGBTQ and with other additional uh, initials sometimes added. Is this the correct way to sort of approach this population from more of a healthcare perspective and standpoint? Yeah, no, it's an interesting thing because we group together a lot of people. What we were just hearing about how there's substantial differences. Some of the letters relate more to sexuality and sexual orientation, others to gender identity, and the care needs are going to be a little bit unique. I do think it's not terrible to put the group together. There's some shared history of, honestly, if I say it, marginalization, both by society and honestly within the healthcare system as well. We have a pretty clear history of labeling both folks who are not heterosexual and folks who are not cisgender as deviant, if I can quote the DSM, and up until fairly recent versions of it. So that's definitely a shared history, and that manifests when you look at health inequities in the population, kind of across the alphabet soup, you'll see issues related to, you know, increased psychic distress, things like that, and sometimes resultant issues like more smoking, more substance use, things like that. But there is really significant intergroup variation, um, you know, both just certain populations, you know, for example, lesbian women, their study is looking at more chronic health conditions, With gay men or men who have sex with men, you have some greater risk in terms of STIs. You also have some greater opportunities. There's some interesting work noticing that um, gay men are actually more likely to have a primary care provider, which I thought was really interesting and kind of flipped the disparity around on its head. And then just one last thing I would say is that the risk of conflating the groups is that you kind of don't pull out the magnitude of issues related to our transgender patients. So like, it's one thing when you say, okay, well, everybody's had some degree of psychic distress. And it's another when you look at studies that show, you know, some studies have said, you know, okay, gay men, maybe one or 2% of the population, or excuse me, one or 2% increased risk of psychic distress versus like 40% in the transgender population, 40% in risk of suicide across the life. That's like 10 times the population average. So I think we have to be a little bit careful about conflating those things. Great. So for our patient miscarriage in particular, uh, Meg, how would you actually approach taking a sexual history for this patient? 
Yeah. So again, one of those things you practice, I think we're all sort of taught to fold the sexual history into sort of the long list of questions. So do you smoke? Do you drink? And then who do you have sex with? It, it can be a little bit jarring to patients. So what I've learned through hard experience is really to stop and take a breath and pause and ask permission. And I think that's the single most important thing that I've learned over time about how to take a good sexual history is to ask permission um, the one thing you have to be okay with is if you're asking permission, they may say no. And that's actually good to know too, because you don't want to plow on if they're not comfortable with it. So they may say no, and then you just put that off to another visit. But you ask uh, for their permission. And then I personally just really um, follow the five P's practice, which is put out by the CDC. So, you know, who are your partners um, and and what types of body parts do you interact with when you're sexually active? So not making any assumptions about the anatomy or the gender of their partners, which is really important. Um, pregnancy, you know, so pregnancy risk, and I think particularly for our uh, uh, people who tr- identify as transmasculine but still have natal anatomy, sometimes that pregnancy risk is overlooked. So asking about pregnancy risk, um, past sexually transmitted infections, and types of protection. So it's a pretty easy rubric that I've used since my medical school days about just walking through the five P's, but making sure that that walkthrough is nuanced in terms of thinking about assumptions and not making them. And and again, a key thing that I've made the mistake of is assuming about the partner and the partner's gender identity and or body parts and making incorrect assumptions about that, which really can shut down the conversation. Yeah, could I just add also, this isn't a traditional P from the CDC, but I think just also positivity a little bit. I think sometimes we get so much into things we have to be asking about, you know, unintended pregnancy risks, which people aren't always even aware of, the STI piece of things. But I think also just about how things are going. Is this a positive experience for you? Particularly when you look at, you know, some of the subcommunities we're talking about here have been pretty stigmatized for sexual practice in the past that I think what we can do to, you know, put forth a culture that sex is happy and healthy, too. And we're going to help you figure out how to make it maybe ideally a little happier and healthier. But um, I think that's another piece that we can add in. Wow, that's great. So let's shoot this question then to Jenny. So what are some unique clinical concerns of our adult LGBT patients? Yeah, I think maybe we'll both take this one a little bit just because there are so many. I mean, I think I can take the piece that relates to what I was saying earlier about some of the disparities that we see. So getting at how we can clinically begin to address them, at least those that are amenable to clinical intervention. So, you know, we already talked a lot about psychologic distress. So being sure to be screening for depression and anxiety in this population. Um, I know Meg has written in the past about being careful to screen for intimate partner violence in this community, which is obviously not an LGBTQ specific piece of advice, but it's worth thinking about again when you um, you know that that's a risk and sometimes particularly LGB people aren't as represented as well in that traditional narrative of um, domestic violence. Thinking about other types of violence too, particularly in the transgender community where you see incredibly disproportionate rates of violence outside of intimate you know, partner type of relationships, I think those are worthwhile things to think about. Um, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about the trans health end of it because there's like a whole unique set of health concerns there or we could talk about that later. Yeah, so I think certainly what's been mentioned before, the risk of suicidality really just has to be first and foremost when you're thinking about um, caring for a transgender individual. Um, I work in the VA in particular where baseline mental health problems are fairly high. And so even among that population, the suicidality risk is that much higher. So um, suicidality and mental health are, are really at the forefront. And then also we know that transgender individuals, some populations within that community have higher rates of HIV. So really thinking about that as well. And then just circling, circling back to some of the other inequities that we've talked about, especially among lesbian women. So we know uh, that there's been a lot of studies that have shown decreased rates of cervical cancer screening, decreased rates of mammography um, in that population, decreased actually a study that we're going to talk about, decreased um, uptake of the HPV vaccine. So it's important to think about things that, you know, lesbian women have a, a unique sexual identity, but they require the same care that all natal women require. So trying to make sure that you're not, you know, thinking too much about the sexual identity and remembering the holistic person in front of you about who they are and what they need just for routine preventative care. That was actually a question I was going to ask is do you, 
I'm not even sure how to best frame this, but is there the risk of sort of focusing not almost too much on this stuff at the expense of I came in because my knee hurts? Like, you know what I mean? Is it, I, I it, it is, is I just, is there ever issues sort of striking balance with the conversation or does this ever cause problems by being almost not too mindful? Cause I don't think it can be that way, but overemphasizing. Yeah. I mean, I think it depends on the scenario a little bit. I think there's a clear sort of no, no area to avoid. And that's particularly for trans identified people. You know, I can't tell you, and I'm sure you hear these stories too, people who were in the ER for wrist pain or whatever, and people are asking them about their transition, you know, that's like, we don't need to do that, you know, right. in the same way that we, you know, don't need to be comprehensive about everybody's holistic care in the ER, you know, when I go in for wrist pain either. But I do think actually one of the really cool things about doing this work as a primary care provider is that it, so much of this LGBT specific stuff really dovetails so nicely with our very typical primary care stuff, whether you're talking about cardiovascular risk assessment, which is a hot topic right now, particularly as it relates to being on hormones for gender affirmation, or talking about bone health, you know, with some of the same pieces or a lot of what Meg is alluding to is about, you know, things, you know, related to stress management and physical activity and things that we would want to bring up with all of our patients. But there may be some little nuances to get at to make sure that you're addressing the unique needs of these patients. I wanted to bring it back to the screening for like mood disorders and suicide risk. Meg, is there specific stuff that you use, questionnaires, ways to standardize that that you recommend to the audience? Yeah, so that's a great question. No, nothing specific. So I use the same PHQ-2 or PHQ-9 that is typically used in everyday primary care. Um, there's no, tra- at, that I know of, Jenny, correct me, there's no LGBT-specific screening tool for mental health disorders. It's more just that the baseline prevalence is higher um, and keeping that in mind when you're using those screening tools. And asking about suicide risk, you just ask, have you had thoughts of harming yourself or killing yourself, same as you would other any other patient you're screening or is there a specific way you phrase it no i would ask just that way but i would also ask about prior suicide attempts i think sometimes we forget about that little piece of it when we're assessing for current suicidality asking about prior suicide attempts because again it is so prevalent in the transgender population more you know it's certainly possible that they had a prior attempt and as we know prior attempts you know prognosticate for future attempts i think that's yeah, that was a similar question I had. You know, I, I do screen for depression fairly routinely, but in the absence of positive depressive symptoms, I probably don't go to that next step and screen for suicidality. Do you do that sort of regardless? I do. Case? Okay. I do in this particular population. Yeah, I, I would. I would totally second that. Yeah. I think we were getting into some other. So, so we that was that we talked about the mental health piece there. What else? What else should we, uh, Jenny? I'll throw this question to you. In specific populations, um, anything else that we need to think about? Well, we were just sort of getting into the cancer screening piece of things, and I think Meg was reminding us that we know in many of the subpopulations, lesbians, trans, masculine identified folks, that there's less emphasis on you. Like, I shouldn't say less emphasis. There's just less uptake around doing Pap smears. So not only just remembering to do them, but thinking about how to do it in a little bit more of a sensitive way. You know, particularly around trans health, we'll ask people how they want their anatomy referred to. Not you know, sometimes we use very gendered language. For example, when you're going to do a gynecological exam, people will talk about doing a woman's exam. That's not particularly helpful if you're working with a trans masculine patient. So just, you know, you already alluded to this, Meg, but just practicing and making sure that you have some language you can use that's a little bit less gendered, you know, asking about, you know, sexual trauma, things like that, you know, some of which you would do for anybody are worth thinking about in this population. And then there's some really interesting questions around our transgender patients and cancer screening. And I think it just, you know, the pearl I think we often talk about is screening what you have and making sure that you have, you know, some, it sounds awfully clinical, but you, people do an organ inventory. And in fact, our, at least at Boston Medical Center, our uh, electronic health record supports this, where regardless of any gender markers, regardless of names, we have a place where we can indicate what organs people have so we don't forget to screen them. And also remember that even just as an example, for example, if you're a trans masculine identified fo- person who's had a chest reconstruction, that's not the same as having a mastectomy, for example. So there's often residual breast tissue left behind. Now we're totally in an evidence-free zone in terms of what to do about it. You have So it's not like I can point you to a wonderful paper that says do this, not that, but at least to be aware there's breast tissue, there's residual risk of breast cancer to be thinking about that and talking about that with your patients. Transmasculine, that's natal female and transition to male sex or 
I, I'm probably I'm messing this up. Can you can you walk us through You're it? Close enough. I think a lot of us would say that it's somebody who's assigned female at birth sure. who is transitioning in a way to be more on the masculine end of the spectrum. And some people would say I'm a trans man. That's sort of a binary identity. And other people would say, you know, maybe I'm gender non-binary, but I was assigned female at birth. I have a uterus or I, you know, have breast tissue. And, you know, those are things worth asking okay. about. So, you know, even though we're telling you to be very mindful of people's identity, and I think that's so important in terms of the mental health piece, there's also the just reality of these are the parts you have. And sometimes yeah. I'll phrase it even that way with people. I don't know if you have a better strategy at all. No, I totally agree. And I think just one point that I wanted to highlight when you were saying that is um, to remember that not all transgender individuals want to transition. Yes. Um, yeah. So remember when we think about transition, so in our sort of medical centric world, we think about hormonal transition or gender affirmation surgery, but people may identify as trans masculine or trans feminine, but not be on medications, not want surgery. It may have no interest in that, but still consider themselves as transgender. So, and they may choose to express themselves as trans feminine or trans masculine in the way they present themselves to society, but they may not want any part of sort of medical intervention. So I try to keep that in mind because again, I think we, we spend a lot of time trying not to make assumptions about patients. And this is one area where I think it's also really important not to assume that a patient would want medications or surgery or any type of intervention at all. Yeah, and when people come to see me, and one of the first questions I'll ask them, somebody who's coming in for gender related care is literally just, I mean, I'll ask them to tell me a little bit about their gender history and not just medical, but social, legal, those types of things. And what are you hoping from medically? And I agree with you. Sometimes it's it's nothing or it's routine care, you know, and then sometimes it's very detailed in terms of interventions like those that you referenced. I like the way you phrase that. What are you hoping for medically? Yeah, because that's a good open ended, and they probably would answer most of the questions you had. It really helps out. And you also get a sense of how much um, space somebody's had in their own life to give thought to this. You know, some people have done tons of reading and have incredible, I mean, everybody has incredible amounts to teach me, but like quite a bit, you know, I've looked at this and I want exactly that. And there's other people, in fact, I just saw somebody recently who was just the person was just saying, I just want to use my name, which was a female name. And this was somebody who was assigned male at birth. And that was like, that was this person's goal for the whole visit was just to use that person's name. And you'll see that I'm avoiding pronouns because that person was still struggling even with how they wanted to be identified in terms of pronouns, but just using the right name was so important. And I thought, okay, this is a therapeutic thing I can do today and we'll see where things go. I have one more follow-up question, Meg. I'll, I'll throw this one to you. When you're when you're doing the anatomy inventory, how do you ask somebody about that without ruffling feathers or just sort of? It's hard. So usually, I couch it in the framework of sort of tell me about who you are, and sort of you know the, the underlying question is there. Sort of tell me your gender story or tell me where you are. And often, as they're unraveling their story for you that'll come up. Now, if it doesn't, then you have to say, you know, I, I'd like to ask you some pretty specific questions, specifically for surgery. Have you had any type of surgery that is gender affirming to you? If so, what types of surgery have you had? But I try to, you know, patient rapport is so important here. So if they can tell me the answers to these questions, just in the context of sort of tell me your story, or how can I help you? Or where have you been before you got here? That can be really helpful. Okay, thank you. I'm I'm just curious. I'm thinking a lot about how I would approach sort of offering like cervical cancer screening or discussing prostate screening in, in individuals with that sort of natal anatomy. Um, and I get nervous just thinking about it, worrying that I could say something wrong. Um, so how do you guys bring up um, those specific sort of specific issues in your clinic? I do, you know. But flip, but I do often use the term of the parts that you have, like, and it often comes, so a lot of times you don't have to ask, it comes out naturally in the story. And then I will talk about the fact that, and this is not so different than what you would say to anybody, you know, we have screening tests. And of course, it, if you're talking about prostate, you're like a variable quality and whatnot, you know, for various parts. I mean, we should review, or you've told me that you have these parts. And so we should talk over time, whether this is something that you would want us to be screening for. And then you have kind of your typical conversation, but I really try to frame it as making sure that for the parts of your body that you have, that we have tests that we think are at least decent and maybe even high quality, hopefully in terms of many of them, let's talk about the pros and cons. And then you have your kind of typical, you know, shared decision-making conversation for that. Great. 
this is this is so helpful. Uh, I want to make a, a little cheat sheet with me with like all these key like gender friendly phrases and and wording. Uh, just sort of sticking on the primary care preventative health. Are there any vaccinations that we should be promoting in this in this population? Yeah, definitely. So all our routine vaccinations, like we'd always think of, and then I sort of keep four additional vaccines in mind for this population, but not all are specific to all the groups. So specifically for gay men, I remember hepatitis A, hepatitis B, and then, so that's all, let me, and let me be careful with my terminology here. So gay men who, men who have sex with men. So again, Gay men refers to the identity, the sexual identity, and then the men who have sex with men refers to the behavior or practices. So for men who have sex with men, um, hepatitis A and hepatitis B vaccine if they're not currently immunized. And if you have questions, you can just check titers and then immunize if they're not, if they don't have appropriate titers. So that's for men who have sex with men. Then I always think about HPV, both for women who have sex with women and and men who have sex with men. Um, Remembering that for men who have sex with men, you can give, according to current guidelines, give HPV vaccine up to the age of 26, um, past the usual 21 that we think of for um, uh, natal men. Um, So, And then meningococcus is the other one. Again, that's for men who have sex with men with sort of certain, what the CDC says says is additional specific conditions like immunocompromised or living in close quarters with other people. So those are the four vaccines that I always sort of in my head prime myself to think about when I'm working with LGBT individuals. If an individual is interested in having the HPV sort of past this age limit, is that something you offer in your practice? Yeah, that is insurance specific. Sure, <laughs> that yeah, that for is sure. Tricky, but this tricky, is a hot tricky. topic for sure. Yeah. 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 The other thing I would just add, this is not vaccine, but it's, it's a kosher to go here. It kind of goes in the same part of the, when I'm, I guess when I'm thinking about my preventative health aspect of my exam is just the contraception question. You know, it's interesting because historically, you know, we would get ourselves in trouble by asking every woman, oh, well, so what do you want to do about contraception? And I can actually say on a personal level as a lesbian, I found that very annoying sometimes. So on the one hand, you can overdo that question. But I think Meg brought up really important things that sometimes we actually underdo it in this community. And we forget about people who might have a need or there's sometimes assumptions out there. For example, you know, being on testosterone, I have patients come in and say, well, I don't get my period, so I can't get pregnant, which that's a big myth that we like to bust right away. That's a good pearl to take home that just being on testosterone is not contraception if you're a trans man, non-binary, whatever. And so just remembering to bring it up in those situations in a non-threatening way is kind of a helpful piece too. That's great. Do we move on to the updates? Yeah. Yeah. So for both of our uh, guests today, they actually served uh, at SGEM and provided updates in LGBT care. So I was wondering if you guys could tell us some of the most practice changing updates in the past year. I mean, I definitely think we need to talk about um, transgender health here. And actually, I'd say two things. One is, ju- well, just stepping back. So one of our big updates is actually that we have more updates. So one of the things is that much of the LGBT community has been a little bit under-researched, particularly in a positive and health-promoting way. And one thing that's cool is we're just having a lot more you know, national surveys, behavioral health surveys who are asking, first around sexual orientation and increasingly about gender identity. So that's kind of awesome and that now you have data and you can do something with it. And And I think one of the key pieces of um, data that's being looked at a lot right now, and I'll be interested in your thoughts about this too, is um, talking about both risk of venous thromboembolism and cardiovascular risk in transgender patients who are taking hormones. And there's going to be a lot of gray here. There's studies that come to different conclusions, but we are in the last last year, we've had two major studies that joined sort of a third prior study that all point to a higher rate of venous thromboembolism in transgender women who take estrogen. So that's something we have to think about and think about how we can carefully mitigate other risks for clot, like doing really important smoking cessation work in this population. So that's been important to see that data laid out because historically, all of our counseling had been extrapolated from cisgender studies. So it's nice to have have this. The data on MIs and strokes is very study dependent. And I think we're going to get into that in some detail tomorrow. Um, and definitely differs if you're a trans woman, trans man, and it depends what reference population you're comparing to as well. But it's nice to see that that data is starting to get out there. I think one take home for our sort of primary care oriented listeners to know is though a lot of these studies, they're early, not some of them lack controls for things that we would really like to see controlled for in a study of, for example, cardiovascular health, like statin use, or aspirin use. And so just to be a 
aware that these studies are super important and moving us forward in this field, but we still have a ways to go. I agree. I, I think really the the big news for us who work in LGBT care is is the um, three recent articles that were published about cross sex hormone therapy in trans women. I think interestingly, so I come from a women's health background, and typically when we think about estrogen therapy in natal women, um, we think about either contraception or postmenopausal hormone therapy, and typically the venous thromboembolism that are are seen in natal women populations happens pretty early in the course of treatment. And so these more recent studies suggest that maybe the VTE risk um, really persists and can increase with time, which is an interesting concept, um, which is quite different and, and really shows how we should not be extrapolating data from natal women into trans feminine care because the preparations not only are different in terms of the type of estrogen therapy, but the, the types of people are very different. And so I think for me that that nuance of, oh, VTE risk is not the same. I mean, we always know estrogen causes VTE, right? That's no big surprise. But this, this piece about how it's not necessarily within the first year, like we've seen in studies with natal women, but that it actually increases over time. And for one of those studies, like six years, it was, was an important thing to, to keep in mind, which is influencing our practice. But again, that extrapolation of data, we really need more data in these populations of patients. About how we implement that. Tempting. Sometimes you read these studies and you say it's an X-fold increase in VTE and a natural question comes, okay, well, should we stop the hormones? And that is obviously a very personal question for anybody, but I think it's a particularly, you know, weighted question when you're talking about gender affirmation. And this is something that comes up pragmatically all the time. And I'm sure you have experiences with this as well. And, you know, here I will speak from personal view, but my personal view is that it's rarely a situation of absolute contraindication, but it's absolutely one that you really have to have detailed conversations with patients about and really, really think about how you can risk reduce, whether it's through avoiding other clot risk factors or whether it's through preparation of estrogen that you're choosing and that kind of thing. But it makes for a very interesting conversation. And it just, I think, also really speaks to why so much of this care is well done during, through primary care. I guess it's a little bit of a plug that I'm going to make because I think a lot of it intersects with just like regular overall health promotion, like we've already stated. So, um, yeah. Any other high high yield clinical pearls that you guys want to talk about from the update? Yeah, I think the other, we talked about a lot of it with the HPV vaccine. Uh, but one thing that uh, we're going to talk about tomorrow is a recent study on pre-exposure prophylaxis called the DEMO study. So as we all know, PrEP has been around for a long time. And in 2012, um, it was recommended that primary care providers really start bringing it into their own practice. The uptake, I think, has been variable according to site. But this demo project was really interesting. So the question that they were trying to answer with the demo project was, we know PrEP works. Why don't we see more people using it? And, and what are some of the issues with that? So it was a, a real-world study where they had three clinics, and uh, two of the clinics were sexually transmitted infection clinics, STI clinics, and they provided the uh, patients who attended those clinics um, PrEP for free for 48 weeks. And they asked questions about adherence, STI rates, and um, high-risk sexual behavior. And what was really interesting, again, in this real-world um, study was that adherence was quite high. Um, so it was most, 85% of patients had detectable levels of um, uh, tenofovir uh, in their um, bloodstream, and um, that lasted over time. So the uptake was actually there. But there were um, some populations that were a little bit less likely to be adherent. And so one of the points of the study was that there may be populations where we need to think about adherence a little bit more in terms of PrEP. Um, the other interesting part about this study is that people who identified as having fairly high-risk sexual behavior were actually more likely to be adherent, which was a really interesting pearl. Um, and I think sometimes goes against what common thought is. But the highest-risk people were the ones who were more likely to be adherent. So I thought that was an interesting study. And can I give one? It's a clinical-ish pearl, and it speaks to my wonkiness around health policy. But I think it's really important, if that's okay to go there, um, which is that there was one of the other studies we'll feature was done actually by a colleague and friend from Boston University, Julia Raifman, looking at basically the impact of discriminatory state laws on the mental well-being of, this is sexual minority patients, so LGB. And to be clear, the only reason she doesn't have transgender patients in there relates to what we said earlier, which is that we weren't collecting the data for a long time. I can only imagine that this study would be 
even more profound in that population. Um, but it was kind of interesting. They looked at states basically that had enacted discriminatory laws. So basically like restricting adoptions to gay couples or religious, you know, whatever that word is, religious objections to, um, um, you know, um, issuing a marriage license or things like that, or even just passing a state law saying that you can't pay st- pass state laws um, protecting sexual gender minorities. That was North Carolina. Sorry. That's a negative <laughs> shout out for this particular state. But anyway, they compared them to, you know, control states that were nearby and geographically similar and controlled for all the usual things. And basically, we're able to show that being in a state that was passing these negative laws was likely to increase your mental distress as an LGB person by like nearly 50%. I think 46% was their exact figure um, relative to other LGB people in states that didn't pass the discriminatory laws. It's like, that's pretty amazing. Because like, of course, we've already said, we know that LGB populations overall have higher risk of mental distress. But to see that splaying of curves based on the laws was pretty powerful. And you'll notice that the same thing does not happen among heterosexual people living in either state, either the discriminatory state or the non-discriminatory state. And it just raises all these interesting questions that are like, yes, policy wonky, but also totally relevant for the exam room. Like, you, you want to say, well, were you personally affected by this law? Probably not in the case of most people, but thinking about sort of what's the media environment, what um, maybe is getting said, you know, at your block party or whatnot, when there's sort of negative images about your community on TV or in the radio, that that is probably really meaningful in terms of getting to some of these mental distress st- statistics that we already talked about. And then the real clinical consequences that I think Meg has driven home for us in terms of not just depression, but suicidality. So I think it's just worth mentioning to say, excuse me, to say that laws like directly impact health. That's not exactly newsy, but I think this, this was a particularly well done study to show that. And I guess it kind of reminds us that as physicians, our job is to get beyond the exam room sometimes too, and that our advocacy around these laws, particularly if we live in a state that's not doing so hot in this department is really profound. And I should be quite clear that it's all of our states. I mean, I'm from like Massachusetts liberal, liberal bastion of the East. And we <laughs> just had a ballot initiative this fall looking to take away public accommodation rights for transgender people. So it's something we all really need to look out for. Thankfully, it did not pass. Any other studies that you all would like to highlight? I think those are like some of the best ones out there. I mean, there's a whole bunch of stuff, but those are some of the highest. Super compelling. Almost beside the point, but how do they actually measure the the distress? There's some standardized scales that you can use, and it basically looks at your mental well-being like on a numeric scale for the last, and I think it's defined as the last, um, like having mental distress more than 14 days of the month where you score X amount. It was the correlate that they used, so... One of the speakers at the plenary this morning literally talked about that yeah. that specific issue that yeah. it was stressing stressing him out just hearing all this stuff happening. Right, right, absolutely. No, he's somebody I get to work with all the time, and he knows that I've just I'm really into the study because we all say that all the time, and this study is like, no, this is an evidence based thing that we need to intervene upon, and to the extent to which we in the medical community are moved by evidence, I feel like we really have it, and we and I know that um, Dr. Raifman is excited to do this with to look at the T, the transgender folks as well, too. And then we'll really, really have the evidence that we need. I think maybe a good place to end is um, would you like to, to plug any resources or, or anything, any anywhere you'd like to direct our audience to, to learn more about this issue? I know we've only kind of scratched the surface. I mean, I think there's a lot of great resources out there um, to look at, uh, both for LGBT health in general and transgender health in specific. Um, you know, my colleagues at Fenway Health across town in Boston have an amazing website and their LGBT Health Institute. And, you know, just so people don't have to reinvent the wheel, they have amazing modules online and tons of information on all the terminology that we went over. So I think that's a great resource. And then my um, residency alma mater, UCSF, um, under Maddie Deutsch's direction, has a really, really great website specifically around trans health and gender affirming healthcare. And I have to say, it's a very nice website because it's it's very user friendly. It's the kind of thing that's short. You can go to it in the context of an actual clinical visit. So we can tell you about all the great guidelines and we use them. But I have to say, when I have a quick question related to gender health, I often go to UCSF's website because it's so well written. 
How about you? Yeah, and so and just the guidelines, because I think what we're both trying to say here is this is specifically for transgender care, something you can do in primary care, yes. but a lot of us haven't received any medical school training or residency training or official training. So in those situations where I feel uncomfortable having a set of guidelines that kind of tells me what to do is really helpful. So the guidelines that I use that I think all of us use are the Endocrine Society guidelines, which were just updated in 2017, and the WPATH guidelines, which are currently being updated um, in addition in addition to the UCSF. And all of those guidelines basically say the same things with some nuances here and there. But at least in terms of if you're a primary care provider trying to get started and you're like, what do I just treat with? What are the medications? They're pretty algorithmic in those guidelines and you can just use any one of them. And it's kind of the same formula to get started. And I found them really helpful when I got started in my practice. Well, it seems almost like the system self-perpetuate. Like if you don't do a good job of providing quality care in this context, you, you won't have the exposure and then you can't get better at it. And then you keep providing not great care and it just kind of goes forward and on and on. So it's nice to know there's so many resources to kind of be helpful and get better at it. Yes. Yeah. And if I can quote one of my mentors from residency who was constantly saying this, he was just like, you know, this transgender health, at least trans hormones, it's an endocrine issue, just like diabetes, except that it's way easier than diabetes because there's not a hundred thousand new classes of medications <laughs> to deal with. And and there's no glucometers involved, and it tends to be, I don't know about you, Meg, but I find it to be a much more straightforward aspect of my practice. And this is all just to really echo what Meg already said, which is that this is something we can do. And I have to say, this is an opportunity for you to really engage in positive care relationships with your patients. Like, even though we have a history, and this is worth naming in the medical system of not creating a welcoming environment for our transgender or non-binary patients, when you do create a welcoming environment, doing gender affirming care is quite honestly kind of fun because people really want to come in you're helping them with something important in your life in their life and that's meaningful you know at a time when you know not every we don't always have great therapy for everything in medicine but this is an area where we actually have some pretty important therapy to offer and it's i think a good reason to offer it as much as anything i think that's a perfect place to end yeah. thank you so much to both of you all right pleasure thank you This has been another episode of The Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. It's just so odd not to have to wait for another grown man to say the word yummy. Get your show notes at thecurbsiders.com forward slash podcast and sign up for our mailing list at thecurbsiders.com forward slash knowledge food to get our weekly show notes in your inbox. We are committed to providing you with high value, practice changing knowledge, and to do that, we need your feedback. So please subscribe, rate, and review the show on iTunes or contact us at the Curbsiders at gmail.com. A special thanks to our producer, Carolyn Chan, as well as our social media team, including Hannah R. Abrams on Twitter, Beth Garbs Garbatelli on Instagram, and Chris the Chew Man Chew on Facebook. I'd also be remiss if I did not call out Nora Toronto and Justin Burke, uh, who were partners in crime throughout most of the SGIM 2019 conference. Uh, without their help, we couldn't have gotten done all the stuff that we got done. And so... On behalf of Dr. Matthew Frank Wado and Stuart Ken Brigham in Absentia, this is Paul Williams. Thanks so much and goodbye. <laughs>